So let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you so much for ministries like Community's Child that open up our minds and our hearts and our lives to some really brutal realities in which families are literally seeking shelter to protect their own children, their lives, and facing dangers and threats from those that they once thought truly deeply loved them. And Father, I thank you so much for uh, the faithfulness and the integrity and the outreach of a ministry like this. And whether it's Community's Child or Beacon Light Mission or others within our own community, thank you for the ways that you open up our lives to step through doors of ministry where in the name of the gospel and by the power of your spirit, we can bring others into a relationship with you as our Father in heaven. And so we thank you so much for this time together that we share, and we pray that you would continue to minister to us for the sake of your Son, by the gift of your Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if I were to be honest, I would say that one of the main reasons why I decided to become a Christian in my student years is that I wanted to go to heaven. And the reality for many of us, whatever our age, if you are the youngest child in our gathering, whether it's online or here at our church, or if you're one of our most senior adults or somewhere in between, it's what we think about when we talk about the good news of the gospel. I mean, consider the reality of of being separated from God and the prospect of being punished and judged as an object of his wrath, being separated from God for all of eternity in hell. And then we hear the good news, whether it's in vacation Bible school or children's worship or in a campus ministry in our college days or maybe with a family gathering during the holidays. And we hear the reality that we don't have to suffer punishment, but that we could spend eternity with God in the best possible place in all of reality. In heaven. And chances are pretty good that for you and me, that we made our decision to believe in Jesus Christ, at least initially, if not largely, based upon the promise of going to a much better place where there is no more disease, there's no more weeping, there's no more mourning, there's no more death where we could have bodies that are glorified and they're not subject to decay and cancer and corruption and elevated blood pressure or glucose levels or anything else that could rob us of our sense of health and well-being on this side of eternity. That we would have a glorified body that would be fit for all of eternity, that would never wear thin, that would always last that we would be reunited with loved ones who have gone on before us. And for many of us, as we think about a family member or maybe a dear friend that is now with the Lord, maybe one of the greatest things that you look forward to is is seeing them in the presence of God. Because being separated from them has been so hard and so difficult. No need for a lamp never going through a a brownout or a blackout, always lit, never dark, no need for road repair because there'll be streets of gold that glitter. There'll be gates that are made of pearl. And these are pictures that speak about the brilliance and the glory and the radiance of the place that we call heaven. And I would say that for many of us, Our decision to believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior has been largely, if not initially, based upon the promise of being in heaven and not in hell. It seems like a total no-brainer for the youngest child, for the most senior adult, and everyone else in between. 
John Piper, who for many years served as the pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, has written a book simply called God is the Gospel, and you can get a free PDF copy if you just search this book. And he speaks about God being the gospel and how meditations on God's love literally drive us back to God himself. And listen to the question that he raises. The critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness, and with all the friends you ever had on earth, and all the food that you have ever liked, and all the leisure activities you have ever enjoyed, and you think about the friendships and the food and the leisure activities, and you think of all of these things, and all the natural beauties you've ever seen, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, and no human conflict, or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? That's the question for your life, for mine, for our generation, and every generation that comes. I mean, heaven is a wonderful place. Heaven is full of everything that we would desire for all of eternity. It's without everything that breaks our heart and causes us to wince within our souls. But the question that he raises is that if heaven had everything, everything that you would ever want, everything that I would ever wish for, but didn't have Jesus... would we be satisfied? The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God. And I think that really dovetails with John chapter 14. Because Jesus is unintentionally causing his disciples to shift into panic mode. They are freaking out over his words about leaving them. They've been with Jesus 24-7, 365 times 3. They have become so dependent upon Jesus and his presence and his grace and his power that they can't imagine life without him. And the prospect of Jesus leaving them is literally freaking them out to the very core of who they are. And Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to go. And I'm going to go to a place. But the good news is that I'm coming back. And it's not simply a place, but it's a place where I am. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. That is heaven. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came into the world for us so that we might come to the Father through him. Jesus came into your life and mine so that we might come to the Father through him. And it's really easy to talk about heaven in a very geographical language. We talk about what it's going to look like and where we're going to be, and we'll talk about these many rooms that, that become a residence of ours by faith in Jesus Christ. But more than a geographical location, Jesus says heaven is about being with the Father, with the Son, and with the Spirit. And in John chapter 14, Jesus puts it all together. He helps us to to wrap our minds and our hearts around the reality that for him to leave us is not a bad thing. It's not a terrifying thing. It's not a, not a scary thing, but it's actually a solid thing. It's a good thing. Because in the absence of Jesus, we experience the presence of God and the presence of Jesus through the presence of his spirit in a way that we can only know if Jesus leaves. You see, Jesus helps us to see how everything comes together. 
Because as Jesus departs to the Father, the Spirit arrives in his name. Being sent by God to reside among us, Jesus, in the same way, sends the Holy Spirit to reside within us. Jesus is leaving, but he says the Spirit of God is coming. You know, when we board a plane for travel, and when we store our baggage in the upper overhead bin, and when we settle into our seats and prepare ourselves for that destination that we had been looking forward to, we can't hate, wait to hear the words spoken by the captain, where he says, we are ready for takeoff. And then he asks the flight attendants, or she directs those serving the passengers to, to get everything ready, because we are ready to go. And that's the title for today's talk, Ready for Takeoff. Because on the one hand, Jesus prepares himself for the completion of his God-given assignment. Jesus is ready for takeoff. He is ready. He's at the, the culmination and the climax, the final lap, as it were, of his assignment from God to fulfill on this planet. And as Jesus looks ahead to the cross and to the crucifixion that he will suffer for us, and when he anticipates the resurrection from dead and his ascension being lifted up to the presence of God and his exaltation at the Father's right hand, Jesus says, I am ready for takeoff. I'm ready to accomplish exactly what God has given me to do. What he has mapped out on my plan, I am ready to accomplish. But on the other hand, as Jesus looks forward to finishing the task and completing the mission and going back to the glory that he shared with his father before even the creation of the world, Jesus wants the disciples and he wants you and me to be ready for takeoff. To be able to say, Jesus, we are ready to let you go. In fact, we're willing to let you go because we love you and and it's your love for the Father that is moving you to take the next step. And as you take the next step, God, we are ready for the adventure that you are placing in our hands. And whatever it is that you want us to accomplish in our life today, God, with your absence in your son Jesus, we know that we could experience the powerful indwelling presence of your spirit to help us to do exactly what you want us to do today. So rather than sulking and being scared and terrified over the physical absence of our Savior, we recognize that the Spirit of God is not only with us, but the Spirit of God is in us. And we're ready to go and to do exactly what God wants us to accomplish. With his departure, Jesus promises the arrival of his Spirit. And Jesus is leaving. He's saying goodbye to his disciples. But he's also telling them, you're not going to be alone. Because the Spirit of God, the advocate, the helper, the one who is literally beside you, he is going to be for you, he's going to be with you, and he's even going to be in you. And in the same way, Jesus Although physically not with us, you are not alone. Because God is with you, his son is with you, and his spirit is in us. And so the question that we could think about later today, in light of today's passage, is how does the Father's gift of the Spirit empower our obedience to, God, to Jesus? How does the Father's gift of the Spirit empower our obedience to Jesus. Because Jesus gives us huge expectations. But it's not in our own strength. It's not with our own ability. But it's by the powerful, enabling presence of God's Spirit. I want to thank you so much for joining us online. And for those of you here at Bread of Life, thanks so much for being a part of our worship gathering. And especially for those that have brought their children to be a part of our children's ministry. 
And I want to thank Auntie Faith and for all of her team, both online as well as in person, for helping our students to know what God has given us, not only in the commands of Jesus, but also in the person of his spirit. And so let's turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. And this morning, we're going to look at the last part of John chapter 14, beginning at verse 15, all the way through the end of the chapter, verse 31. In verses 15 to 24, Jesus provides a very simple correlation. And the correlation is this, is that we keep what Jesus commands if we love him. It's as simple as that. We could talk real spiritual. We could look real holy. We could act all godly. But the measure of our love for Jesus is not our talk or our look, but it's our actions. And it's not a matter of, Jesus, I know what you want me to do, but... Or I know what your expectations are, but Jesus, it's so hard. But the simple correlation is that we will keep what Jesus commands. We will hold his word in our hearts and live a life of obedience and submission to his will if we genuinely, consistently, authentically love him. And then in verses 25 to 31, we see the perfect example of this correlation between love and obedience. Because Jesus does what his Father commands because he loves him. Obeying the Father even to the point of death. And Paul writes to the Philippians, even death on a cross. Because his love for Jesus, Jesus' love for the Father is so radical, it's so wholehearted, it's so comprehensive that he's willing to obey him to the very end. And so remaining totally focused on doing the will of the one who sent him, Jesus defines his own relationship with God. And short and sweet, Jesus gets to the point. Take a look at this simple correlation, how we keep what Jesus commands if we love him. Take a look at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, a, a helper, a comforter, a, someone who will come alongside of you to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. In the first half of the chapter that Dave spoke on a couple weeks ago, Jesus makes a handful of pivotal, monumental promises to the original disciples and to us. Because as we've talked about, as Jesus talks about the imminent, imminent departure that he's about to leave, the disciples are shaking in their sandals. They're petrified in their hearts. They're having these, this severe panic attack because they don't know how they're going to get on without Jesus. And so Jesus speaks these amazing words of reassurance. He says, guys, don't sweat. Don't freak out. Realize that I'm leaving you, but I'm going to my father's house where there's many rooms and I'm preparing a place for you. But Jesus says heaven is not simply geography or location, but I'm preparing a place so that you could be with me where I am. For all eternity. And Jesus says, you know the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And one of the disciples says, wait, how do we know the way? I mean, can you, can you send us a map? Can you give us some details? Can you, t can you lay out the directions for us? And Jesus says, well, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And then another disciple says, oh, Jesus, you're speaking way over our heads. Let's, let's just make it simple, Jesus. Just show us the Father and we're good to go. And Jesus, I don't know if he can't hold back the laughter or the sadness, but he says, man, haven't I been with you long enough? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. If you've recognized my powerful works, you've seen the powerful hand of God at work. Jesus gives them these amazing promises. But I think the hardest to believe, but true to the core promise, that Jesus delivers to his disciples is what you hear in verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, the, f- the favorite phrase in John where Jesus says, don't forget this. If your attention is directed somewhere, focus all of your mind and all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength on this word. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing turning water into wine, enabling a man born blind to see, a man who for 38 years couldn't walk and just saying, stand up and pick up your pallet and go for it, raising the dead, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And you're thinking, what's, what's Jesus promising here? Is he saying that the ministry of the disciples will somehow be qualitatively better than what Jesus had done? How could that be? Something, is, is Jesus speaking in terms of quantity, that, that the works of Peter and John and James and every successive generation of disciples will cumulatively be greater than the number of Miracles that Jesus has done, where John even says, even if I had all the library at my disposal and all of the hard drive, the gigabytes and the terabytes to store the miracles of Jesus, that that we would even do more? I think the key phrase is where Jesus says, because I am going to the Father. Risen, exalted, seated at his Father's right hand, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of our church, continues to build his church for his Father's glory. Through the presence of his Spirit in the lives of followers who are living in obedience to him. And I think that's what Jesus is saying, even greater than the works that he has done in his physical earthly ministry, that the works that the exalted, risen, glorified Messiah would accomplish by the power of his spirit through the obedient faithfulness of his disciples in our generation, even in our lives today, that that would even exceed what he accomplished over the span of his earthly ministry. And it's coming on the heels of these tremendously huge promises that Jesus spells out this simple yet substantial correlation. If we truly love him, we faithfully keep his commands. And we get that in real life. I mean, it's the mark of a friendship. When you find out that that a good friend of yours likes a certain kind of food, that you're going to go get that food and you're going to bring it to them and you're going to see a smile on their face because they love that food. It's what we see in families with parents and kids and husbands and wives. We try to find out what what makes them happy and what their desires are and the things that, that bring pleasure into our hearts. And rather than going in an opposite direction, we try to move our lives in that same direction. Because love and obedience go together. The things that bring happiness to someone, the things that bring joy to another person, become the things that we delight in and that we rejoice in and that we love if we're in a healthy relationship with that person. It's a friendship that sucks or a family relationship that's horrendous where we move in opposite directions doing what bugs them and disregarding their desires and dishonoring their wishes. 
And it's just as true in your relationship with Jesus. It's just as true in my relationship with him that if I genuinely love him, if you consistently say, Jesus, I want to live under your authority and surrender my life to your will, then we're going to live a life of obedience because our affection for the master becomes evident in our allegiance to his word. An actual love for our Savior translates into an actual pursuit of his will. So that's why we'll care about the great commandment, to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul. That's why we'll care about being able to love one another as we love ourselves and to, to fulfill the great commission to make disciples of all nations where we will want to be salt and light in our world, where we will desire to seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness, where we want to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and to follow him. Even more recently in John chapter 13, where we will seek to love one another as he has loved us. And even though it's dirty stuff, we'll be willing to get on our knees and to wash the feet of others and to have a heart that is gracious and sacrificial in serving others just as Jesus has served us. You see, the mark of our love for Christ is not simply what I say or how I look, but it's actually the pattern and the course of our actions. It's what we do, and not simply what we say. Jesus wants us to go before God and ask for anything in his name. And Jesus said he will do it. And at the top of the list, he wants us to pray for obedience for one another, for ourselves. He wants us to pray that we would be a faithful and a godly and a reverent community of men and women and students who live not according to the contour of their own desires, but live according to the commands that Jesus has given to us. So that people would look at Bread of Life Church and they would not simply say, oh, I love that place because you could do whatever you want or you could design your own discipleship and what it means to be a follower of Christ. No, I want people to say the Bread of Life Church is an attractive and a compelling community because they are a people that live in obedience to God. They live in submission to the will of their Savior. They live according to the commands that God has given to us. And it's not as we wish, but it's what as the Savior wills for us. The Holy Spirit is what Jesus promises to us. And Jesus petitions the Father to grant us precisely, not simply what, but who we need in his absence. That the Father gives us an advocate, a paraclete, someone who comes alongside, it's a legal term, someone who's going to come to our defense and our protection. And it's the spirit of truth, and, and we see that to begin to be fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 in the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, at that moment, the Spirit of God not only comes to be with you, but also comes to be in you. And the spirit of truth helps us to, to know what the reality of the gospel is all about. To live with the person of God the Father, to live in the presence of God the Son, and to live by the power of God the Spirit. And Jesus says the Spirit of God is going to be an oddity or a stranger to the world because they don't know him, but the Spirit of God is going to be your companion. He's going to be your presence, who's our strength, our help, our comfort, our defender. And as the disciples grapple with the prospect of Jesus leaving, he clarifies that it's a momentary departure that he's going to come back. Take a look at verse 18.
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live resurrected, triumphant, victorious. You also will live eternal life, even though we die physically, forever with the Lord. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands, reiterating this basic correlation, and keeps them, that's what it means to be a disciple, is to have the camp commands in our hearts, and it's to keep them. That is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I, too, will love them and show myself to them. I love John 14. Staggering, mind-blowing, soul-defying, earth-shaking promises of our Savior. I will come to you. You will see me, the anticipation of these post-resurrection appearances. The moment after Jesus is raised from death to life, he begins showing up to his disciples, not only provide them confirmation that everything he had promised them is actually true so that the basis of their faith is real, but that he has been vindicated throughout his ministry in coming back from death to life. And even in his post-resurrection appearances, Jesus provides for them greater reassurance and confirmation and instruction for how he will accomplish greater works than he did during his lifetime through obedient disciples who live by the power of his spirit. Because I live, you also will live. And then he says... On that day, following my resurrection, you will realize, in other words, things will click. Things will begin to make sense. That I share a uniquely tight relationship with my Father, that I am in my Father. And that I have a treasured, intimate relationship with you. That you are in me, and I am in you. D.A. Carson has written a number of books, and one of the little books that is not picked up often is a book that was based upon four theological lectures to a group of seminary students. The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. And it makes sense that he would give something like this with that title to to a gathering of seminary students and faculty members. And yet, how could the the love of God be so difficult? And D.A. Carson, who has given a large part of his academic professional life to the study of the Gospel of John and even the love of God that's developed within this Gospel, helps us to understand just how difficult something that we believe is so simple actually is. He says, first of all, there's this intra-Trinitarian love. The Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father. Then there's this providential love that God has for all of creation, and we call it common grace, where the sun rises and the rain falls on both the good and the evil. And then he speaks about the love of God toward the world and the person of Christ. And he speaks about God's love in a saving sense. And that's when we think of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. But then there's a fourth way in which it's God's love for the elect. That when God says through the Apostle Paul that there's nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, it's in a chapter that is heavy on the sovereign election of God in Romans chapter 8. But then he speaks also of a fifth way, if you can imagine it, 
of how the love of God is something to unpack. He says, God's love is sometimes said to be directed toward his own people in a provisional or a conditional way. Conditioned, that is, upon obedience. Your son, your daughter, your spouse, maybe even your mom or dad, they might do something that just, just goes against you, and yet you say to them, I love you. My love for you will never stop. But let me just tell you, I'll love you a lot more if you do what I say. And it's not that they'll increase the level of their love, but their experience of our love for them will be kicked up to another level. And I think that's exactly what this fifth kind of love is all about. It's the love that Jesus describes here in John chapter 14, that we experience God's love for us in a deeper and a richer and a fuller way, that we experience intimacy with God in a sweeter way when we live in obedience to him, when we do what he desires, that we experience the fullness and the joy and the reward of a relationship with him. Technically, it doesn't increase the level of love that he has for you and me. But practically and experientially, we experience a fuller and a richer and a sweeter joy when we walk with him. Take a look at verse 22. Then Judas, and John clarifies, not Judas, son of Iscariot. This is probably Judas, son of James, also known as Thaddeus. Judas is stuck with a question. He says, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And, and rather than thinking about the simple correlation, if you love me, you're going to do what I say. He's thinking about Jesus saying, I'm not going to show myself to the world on that day when I come to you following the resurrection, but I'm going to come to you and to show myself and to reveal my heart and to disclose my glory in a way that will forever transform your life and ministry for me. So Judas, not Iscariot, son of James, also known as Thaddeus, says, wait, Jesus, don't you want to be this Messiah to the world? Isn't it that you're, you want your glory to be seen by all of the nations? Why only come to the disciples? Why limit your audience? And Jesus, rather than answering that question directly, reiterates the simple truth. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them. And I love this, and make our home with them. You see, back on the top of the chapter, Jesus says, in my Father's house are many homes. In my Father's house are many dwelling places that you will come to in my presence if you follow me as the way. It's that same word that Jesus now says, not only will I prepare for you in my father's house where there are many rooms, but my father and I will make our room with you. Not only having a dwelling place in heaven, but Jesus and the father will make their dwelling place with us if we obey him. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Jesus is the perfect example of obedience, sent by the Father, speaking his words. A richer Sweeter, deeper intimacy where God the Father, God the Son, make their dwelling place 
with us as we choose to obey him. Matt Smethurst is a pastor in Virginia, and he wrote an article that's entitled, Don't Follow Your Heart. And he was inspired by his five-year-old daughter who, after watching an animated film, and as a pastor, he's trying to teach his children, as young as they are, to, to watch things with discernment, to try to spot the truth and to spot the lie to think of things from God's perspective. And this film that his five-year-old daughter watched is literally described as a film about happiness. And the daughter, you know, after watching that film, pitter pattered upstairs and she said, Daddy, is happiness found inside of us? Because that's what the movie told her. This really cute animated film about happiness told her that you could find happiness in yourself. But that didn't sound right to her. And then she said, Daddy, isn't happiness found in God? In one scene near the end, a character delivers the key idea of this movie. Happiness is inside of all of us, right? Sometimes you just need someone to help you find it. And Matt Smithhurst goes on to write, if traditional cultures tended to reduce people to their duties, their responsibilities, their obligations, the modern world reduces people to their desires, to their wishes, Just listen to the soundtrack of our age. Follow your heart. Be true to yourself. Find yourself. Love yourself. Express yourself. Believe in yourself. We inhabit a secular age in which transcendence, something beyond ourselves, has been thinned out and trivialized, and the sovereign self thrust to the center of the stage. And so pilgrimages to find truth and beauty and goodness don't require a plane ticket, just a mirror. We would look at ourselves and ask ourselves what we love and what we feel and what we believe. And then he concludes, if a traditional view of identity effectively says you are your duties and modern identity says you are your desires, then a gospel identity says, you are your saviors. You belong to him and to his people. In a cultural climate that prefers to carve out its own path, that revolves around what we believe and what we desire and what we wish, it's hard to get the simple correlation that Jesus makes. It doesn't matter what I desire. It doesn't matter what Jesus commands. It doesn't matter what the culture dictates. It's about what God delivers in his word. We faithfully keep what Jesus commands if we genuinely love him. And that obedience leads to an experience of love and intimacy with the Father and the Son that is conditioned upon our obedience. And the perfect example of this is what Jesus does. Because Jesus does what the Father commands because he loves him. Take a look at verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the defender, the Paraclete, the one who's going to come alongside of you, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, being sent by the Father into the world, God now sends his Spirit into his disciples. He will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Isn't that good news? Because the longer we live, the more we forget. 
you know, I, I, I know it's in the Bible. I know it's somewhere. I know what God wants. I, I, I used to understand what this means. Jesus says, God will send in my name the Spirit of God who will not only instruct you the things that you should do to hold on to, but he'll actually remind you of those things in the moment of your trial and the hardship of temptation and the very critical moment when we need a word from Jesus. The Spirit of God will bring it into our hearts. He'll remind our souls he will empower our wills. He'll remind you of everything I've said to you. And then 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, a peace that's transitory, that's short-lived, that's limited, that doesn't endure. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I mean, if we were to slip our feet into the sandals of the 11, we totally get the anxiety. We can really feel the panic within their hearts and the fear of, of thinking about life without Jesus. But Jesus says, man, things will get bad. There's going to be a betrayal. There's going to be denial. There will be my departure. But that's not the end of the story. I will give you the Spirit, the Spirit of God, in my absence, will be your defender, will be your advocate, will be the one that, that is your best instructor, that, that the times that we spend in the Word of God alone and mentoring relationships with others and community groups and in Bible studies with one another, in, in times like this in, in our gatherings of worship, that, that as we take in the Word of God, the Spirit of God, His principal responsibility is to help us to not only to know, but to do the will of God. It's not only to have, but it's to hold His truth in our hearts. But Jesus also says, along with the Spirit, he will give us his peace. Literally his erene, his shalom. This idea of completeness and wholeness and someone that is safe and sound and secure. It's like when you see a family member or a friend and you say, hey, how's it going? And you say, well, you know, the world around us is crazy, but things are good. That is shalom. That is erene. That is peace. That means the world could be chaotic and out of control. Things could be topsy-turvy. Things could be, could be absolutely maddening. But if you have his peace, you are good. You are safe. You're secure. You feel complete. You don't have all the answers. Everything's not happening according to our wish list. But the peace that gives us this ability to not only with, withstand the troubles of this world, is the same kind of peace that emboldens us to speak for him. So that we could offer this peace to others. And we look into the lives of our family members and friends and we see lives that are troubled. We, we get messages of people that are going through turmoil. And as the peace of Jesus not only guards our heart, it gives us messages of hope that we can share with others. Protecting us from the evil of this world. The peace of Jesus propels you and me for the good of his kingdom. Take a look at 28. Jesus said, you heard me say, I am going away. And maybe Peter said, you could say that again. And I am coming back to you. 
If you loved me, you would let me go. You would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I'm living not according to my own plan, but according to the plan of my Father. I'm to live in subordination to his purposes. I am living for his glory. And as I glorify the Father, then his glory comes through me. And Jesus says, guys, if you love me, then you would want me to live in obedience to the Father. I have told you now, verse 29, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Verse 30, I will not say much more to you. Time is short, for the prince of this world is coming. But let me clarify. Things will look demonic. Things will look like Satan has, <laughs> has the victory in the final exclamation mark in history. But Jesus says he has no hold over me. But he comes even to serve the purposes of God so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now. Let us leave. Talk about a resolution for obedience. You see, Jesus says that from the world's vantage point, Dying on the cross looks like he loses and Satan wins. But Jesus says, oh, that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, when Satan comes, he's going to be an object lesson of God's in which God teaches the world that Jesus is living in obedience to the Father, that his obedience to the Father is so radical and so complete that it's even upon death on a cross. And that rather than being an exclamation mark of victory for Satan, it's going to be a mark of his defeat. And that Jesus' love is so complete. It is so unflinching. It is so unyielding that he's willing to lay down his life for you and me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And Jesus so loved his Father in heaven such that he would live in total obedience to him, even death on a cross. We started our time together with a question about whether heaven had everything, everything we could ever want on this earth. But if it didn't have Jesus, would we be satisfied? I want to raise another question. And it's a question directed to men. Men, are you submissive? And you think, what? That's a question Michael Kruger has raised because he's president of Reformed Theological Seminary on the East Coast. Because when we think of submission, we think of Ephesians 5, women, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. But he says, hey, guys, how about you? Are we submissive to the Lord? Our cultural moment, Kruger writes, it's not one that values a posture of submission to authorities. On the contrary, our world says we should challenge and critique those over us. Question authority is what the bumper sticker tells us. But the Bible is clear that everybody submits to somebody. Men and women are called to submit to the government. Children are called to submit to parents. Church members are called to submit to their elders. Servants are called to submit to masters. And on it goes. And the ultimate demonstration of that submission is a good and biblical virtue is that it was practiced by our Lord himself. And here's the point that Kruger communicates. Submission is not a female virtue. It's a Christian virtue. 
So when we as Christians, both male and female, deny ourselves, submit ourselves to those in authority over us, then we are doing something distinctively just like Jesus. And so when we say, not as I will, but as you will, we are acting like our Savior. Good theology is so immensely practical because it shows us and the world. It becomes a stage in which a watching, thoughtful world is somewhat skeptical about what we want to teach them. But good theology shows the essence of real faith. And so let's not miss the way that Jesus totally submits himself to do the will of him who sent him. And that's what John 14 is all about. That Jesus has to go because that's the Father's plan. And as the Son departs to the Father, then the Spirit arrives in his name. And it's because of his obedience to the Father's commands that we can live today in obedience to what he speaks to us in the power of his spirit. And so I want you to be ready. To be ready for takeoff in whatever adventure God gives to you. And he gives you that adventure with clear-cut commands that as we hear his word, that we would also do them just like him by the power of his spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that Jesus showcases for us what it's to like to live in obedience to you. And it's because of his death on the cross that we have life and promise and hope, not simply in the place of heaven, but in the glorious presence of our Father in heaven. And Lord, I pray for anyone this morning that is still holding out about where they stand with your Son. And I pray that even in this moment that they would believe in Jesus as their personal Savior, knowing that he died for them on the cross for their sins so that they could live in your presence with your glory. Lord, you know that command that we must follow today. Help us by the strength of your spirit to do what our Savior commands. And it's for his sake we pray.